Hello everyone, uh, I'm Anita Jovic. I'm the founder and the president of uh, Serbian AI uh, Foundation. And uh, I want to thank you all uh, for joining this uh, uh, exclusive and really important uh, subjects, which is importance of ethical AI. Uh, and thank you, Linz, for introducing us. It was a great uh, panel before us. Uh, so I want to welcome Olivia uh, Gambelin. Uh, she's the founder and of Ethical Intelligence and CEO, and also an AI ethicist who is working with entrepreneurs to bring ethical analysis and uh, into the technology development. Uh, she's uh, joining from Silicon Valley, and sh uh, she is really amazing person. I'm really happy that she is uh, on the conference today. So, uh, Olivia, uh, welcome. Hi, Anita. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, hi, I'm really, really happy that, that you are uh, with us today. And uh, I think that this is a really important subject and uh, it, it needs to be addressed uh, definitely. So uh, I'm really curious. Um, I would like for, um, let's say, to introduce a little bit uh, to the audience what we are going to cover. In the first part, we'll talk uh, more about why it's ethical AI, uh, like ethics in AI, why is it important? Then the second part is more about the application and what is, uh, let's say, the uh, narrative globally. And uh, the third part would be how to start career uh, in uh, this field and maybe more explore these uh, options. I will also invite the uh, public to ask uh, any question during this, uh, this uh, part, this uh, speech, and uh, maybe you can ask it during the, the, the conversation with Olivia or in the end. Feel free to to ask in any moment. Uh, we want. I want it to be more interactive. So Olivia, uh, welcome. And uh, I just wanted to ask you for for the start to maybe uh, say uh, why ethical AI. Why what motivated you to to enter this field? Ooh, a lot of different reasons, but um, it all kind of boils down to the fact that I was combining this fascination with technology. I grew up in the Silicon Valley. I grew up. Uh, we joke that we're kind of guinea pigs out here. All of the tech companies out here use the people that live in this area as the first testers, the first adopters for their technology. So I grew up on the cutting edge of seeing brand new tech roll out, oftentimes before friends and colleagues in different parts of the country or different parts of the world. And so I had, I grew up with this fascination of technology. Um, I like to say out of rebellion, I then went and studied ethics and morality in my undergrad and my master's degree, but that was more of my intellectual passion. And when I came across the subject, the kind of conversation as it was just beginning to hit the mainstream of ethical AI data ethics, um, it was this moment of, well, that is my fascination of technology and my intellectual passion coming together into the same, into the same field. And it was, uh, yeah, I think I think I look back on it and it, and a lot of different parts of my life led to me actually working in this field. But those those are kind of the main um, factors that contributed that led me to where I am today. It's pretty impressive. I like the combination because it's really rare and people usually think that uh, you need to only have a technical background, which is not the case nowadays. So it's really it's really a great example how to combine the two really important areas so we can bring more innovation. And uh, I want to ask like uh, to, to say more a little bit more about your company and uh, what you do at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So I run ethical intelligence. Uh, we call it EI for short, since ethical intelligence could be long, but EI for short. We're an AI ethics advisory firm, and we specialize in working with startups and SMEs. Um, so we are pioneering a service. It's actually called Ethics as a Service. This term was only coined by Floridi three or four months ago for the first time used in one of his papers. Um, but essentially what we do is we work with entrepreneurs and management of smaller companies to understand the impact potential of their technology. Um, what I like to tell clients is we're going to establish the spectrum that your technology exists in. So we will establish the worst case scenario, meaning it's a dumpster fire, everything's gone wrong, everything's uh, the technology you've created is being misused, there's harm coming out of it. That's one end of the spectrum. And then you have the other end of the spectrum, 
where not only have you prevented things from going wrong, but you're really doing everything right. And it's and it's this amazing piece of technology. It's bringing a lot of benefit to your users. It's bringing a lot of benefit to your company as well. That's the spectrum that your technology potentially exists within. And what we do is we use ethics as a tool to help guide your decision making that towards the best case scenario. So putting up the proper um, the proper restrictions and ga and guards to prevent the dumpster fire, to prevent the worst case scenario, and helping guide you through strategic decision making, um, using ethics as a tool towards strategic decision making for that best case scenario. Um, and it's it's all incorporating the mission and the values of the company and making sure those are realized throughout the scale of the company itself. That's really impressive. Yeah, it's it's really like uh, I wanted to ask uh, when you say some consequences that there are if uh, some uh, companies are not acting uh, ethically or in accordance to the policy. So uh, what benefits are there to the, to the ethics and is it any kind of migration uh, risk for migration out there? Yeah, so ethics is a very interesting field. Um, the majority of conversations you'll hear is ethics as a risk mitigator. So preventing uh, these these terrible situations from happening from, um, we see them hit the news all the time, the kind of dystopia, uh, HR hiring tools that uh, are discriminatory towards a certain co color of skin or a certain gender. Um, you see these kind of dystopian big, problems. Um, so ethics is usually grouped in with risk mitigation to catch those problems before they hit the market. In those cases, if that ever happens, it's reputational damage. And in the case of especially startups, there's no company after that. Um, but one of the things that we focus on at ethical, uh, ethical intelligence is actually using ethics not only as that risk mitigation tool, but also a tool for innovation. Um, ethics Actually, when you take the definition from the ancient Greek philosophers, which I promise this this uh, makes sense in, in modern day as well still, uh, ethics is the pursuit of the good life. So what it's doing is helping you understand what is the good life, what is the purpose of what you are doing, and how you can make decisions and have certain actions that guide you towards that good life that you've defined. Um, and with that, you have to be very creative. You have to be very innovative about how you're designing your technology to meet user expectations, to uphold values that cultural values, societal values, company values. That actually is a very innovative process and it's very um, useful to use ethics as a tool in that case. Uh, so it's it's two sides. You have the risk mitigation, which always sounds really scary to people, but is, is very, very important. And then you have the innovation side, which becomes very creative uh, and quite a beautiful side of ethics. Thank you. I live it, misspell it, but thanks. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, uh, there is some good examples for sure how to implement. Uh, and can you can you explain us maybe a little bit more that of that good example how to to implement uh, ethical AI because we are aware that. Uh, so, for example, in EU, in European Union, there is new policies that are introduced. So the the field is changing like uh, every year. So, can you just give us maybe a framework or some pathway that uh, how, how what is the good some example of implementation? Yeah. So thankfully, the EU has been putting out uh, regulations just April this year. So last last month, we saw the new AI regulation proposals coming out. Um, which is a great step in in a good direction. Uh, there does need to be some type of regulation in terms of the risk factors that happen in, in AI. Um, the interesting part to that is ethics exists kind of a layer above legal requirements. You have legal requirements and a company can be perfectly legal, but still unethical. And what that means is your user will still feel disrespected trying to connect this to something beyond just, oh, you know, you, you need to have this vague thing above legality. You actually have ethics above it. And that is the respect for your end user, the respect for the human at the end of it, in the equation, um, so to speak. So there are frameworks um, such as the EU AI regulation guidelines. There's um, the high level expert groups, um, AI ethics policies are great frameworks and guidelines. Um, but those point you in the first initial direction. From, from there, it comes more into incorporating different methodologies that have existed for centuries within ethics 
Um, there's something called virtue ethics, there's deontological ethics, there's utilitarian ethics. These are all frameworks. And these frameworks are methodologies that ethicists use to then interpret and understand the different decisions that are being made by individuals in building their technology. Um, so I can give you an example actually between deontological and utilitarian ethics. Um, you'll usually hear them as a duty ethics actually for deontological, but that's very rule-based. So what you're doing is you, if you are building a technological system or an AI application, and you're like, okay, we're gonna do, we're gonna follow the framework of deontolo deontology, um, of deontological ethics. You're very, very rule-based. So it's it's more black and white. So for example, um, if a rule says do not lie, there's no exception to that, meaning you do not lie, done. Even those kind of white lies that you tell so to protect people's feelings, those, those fall under do not do that, um, according to deontological. Where then if you were saying, okay, well, I, I I want to design an application instead around uh, utilitarian ethics um, and that using that framework as a part of the DNA of my of my AI. What you're looking at is the outcomes, outcomes of the decision. So are you uh, looking <laughs> one of the best examples? One of the clearest examples, actually, is um, back to that trolley problem. So or that self-driving car problem nowadays. But if you are looking at do you run over one person or five people? Well, according to utilitarian ethics, you would run over one person because five people have better benefit. Like there's more, there's more positive coming out of saving five lives than than one life. Again, there's a lot of exceptions there. That's a very general statement. But those are the those are two of the main frameworks that we see used quite often um, when embedding ethics into kind of the DNA of of AI applications. Yeah, as you said, uh, like it, it's really a complex subject. And uh, for example, if uh, is there a comparison like uh, when implementing this framework, like uh, what can be the consequences? Is it uh, uh, depending on the policy in which country you are or is it like more of uh, some global ethics that we need to, to follow through? So policies definitely have a big role in this, considering there are different policies per country. Um, there are, however, general truths, we'll call them. These are overarching cap capital T truths that uh, focus on certain aspects of AI. So, excuse me, for example, um, bias mitigation is a big one where that is generally understood of we're trying to make fair algorithms, we're trying to make fair applications that don't give um, uh, improper weight to different, to different um, demographics. So um, what I mean there is an algorithm favoring uh, someone of Caucasian descent over someone of African descent for no other reason except for the skin color. That would be a, that would be an unfair bias that we would want to remove from the system. That is generally accepted across across um, country lines as something that we want our algorithm we something that we want to remove from our algorithms. So there are general truths in that way that we see cross culturally, not dependent on policies. Um, the policies, though, help add the nuance. There's as you get deeper and deeper into these technologies, as you get deeper into the difficult decisions made around these these uh, applications, then the policies start to have more um, more weight in terms of helping you prioritize the different values that are important to your decision making. Okay, uh, is there like uh, can you maybe give some examples of uh, consequences? Like uh, as you said, uh, it can be for example for startups if they don't follow this through, it can be like finished reputation, and it will be really hard not only to to for a company but even for a founder to start a new product. So can you give maybe some of the examples there? Yeah. So one of the. Uh, best and most terrifying parts to ethics is uh, ethics builds consumer trust. And trust is one of those factors that is, as soon as it's broken, it's very, very difficult to rebuild it. Um, think of it, you break a dish, the dish will never be whole again. There's always that slight crack somewhere in there of a little bit of doubt. And it works the same with technology. As soon as you lose the trust of your users, you can do everything you can to rebuild that trust, but it's never going to be what it was once before. And that 
user trust translates into competitive in the market, um, competition in the marketplace. So I will use a product that I trust over one that I don't, even if the other one that I don't trust is the better product at the end of the day, if I don't trust it, I'm going to go with the one that I do trust. And this is me speaking from a user perspective. So not only do you have this reputational risk. So if, if you haven't considered ethics and a big scandal comes out about your technology or about your product, um, of course, it's always attached with some type of harm done to a person, but then it also ruins, let's say your, your reputation, um, your reputation as a, as a trustworthy organization, as a trustworthy company. In the case of startups, that means your startup doesn't exist anymore. Um, in the case of larger corporations, that can often lead to uh, both legal cases and uh, liability. Liability comes into play that can be very costly, um, but also it's a lot of work to then regain at least a fraction of your of your consumer's trust. I totally agree. I recently saw one poll on the LinkedIn uh, when it comes to big corporations in which do they trust the most. And because one they, they had one of the legal case, uh, a lot of people lost trust in giving their them data. So I don't want to name the other corporations, but uh, most of them uh, knows who it is. So uh, I think you're like absolutely right and uh, i wanted to ask like uh, when we compare like uh, is there a difference between uh, ai ethics in the large enterprise and ai ethics in startups uh, and the entrepreneurs absolutely and that's that's a great point to make um to highlight so large organizations large enterprise those kind of companies are focused on more the process so it's AI ethics becomes more of top-down governance. You see a lot of <clears throat> protocols, you see uh, frameworks, you see checklists about different, um, different positions within the product development cycle having to report on different metrics. And it's very, um, those can be very heavy processes, but that is the general approach that's taken by big enterprise. On the opposite end, you have startups and SMEs who they can't, they, they, they just can't be held to those kind of protocols. First of all, once the protocol is developed, it's out of date by the time it's developed for a startup because a startup's in a, reiterating so quickly that they need, um, the protocols don't grow with the startups. Um, it then becomes this kind of time sink for a startup. So a startup, an SME, an entrepreneur, the focus there is actually a cultural focus where you're looking at the culture of the company and you're looking at the training and the skill set of the employees. That's the focus on actually teaching, um, teaching your employees, teaching your, your colleagues, um, teaching the teams of startups how to spot and how to how to spot these these difficult decisions and how to work through them. Um, so it's it's a different perspective. That's more of a bottom up approach that startups take. So it's it's um, it's important to have some measure of both a top down and a bottom up approach. But when it comes to startups, the focus and the emphasis is really on building a company culture around ethics, um, the bottom up approach, whereas large enterprise, the focus is on having the protocols and frameworks in place. So that top down approach. That's pretty pretty great point. I think, especially when it comes to deep tech, it's really hard to to catch to keep up with uh, all the policies that in, that needs to be done, and call like focus on culture. It's a really great point to to have, and uh, especially uh, when it comes to uh, maybe uh, following all this through, it's really important to. Uh, hire a uh, experienced consultant because a lot of startups avoid that uh, either because of budget or because uh, uh, I don't know other reasons uh, they think they know it all I think it's really important to to onboard uh, the right uh, consultant or the right uh, um, people in the team so it's really you you will avoid in the end <laughs> the bigger catastrophe for sure uh, it's really important in in this field okay um i wanted to maybe uh transfer more to to the how to get into this field 
Uh, you have uh, really the words, as you said, you have uh, a diploma in uh, philosophy and uh, also as an entrepreneur. Uh, so what does it mean to, to be trained as an AI ethicist? Is there a skill set that you need to have uh, or how does it go? Yeah, that's, again, a, a great point to draw attention to because um, we saw a few years ago a lot of people saying, oh, I'm an AI ethicist, and there was a confusion of well, what does that actually mean? There's a difference between having being enthusiastic and well-read in terms of AI ethics, meaning up-to-date on current issues, up-to-date on current policies. There's a difference between an enthusiasm and a... a um, a strong understanding of current issues in AI ethics and actually being a practicing ethicist. An ethicist really is a skill set. We have a certain skill set that we're trained on. Um, and how I explain it to people is I am trained. I <laughs> actually, one of the first things I tell a, a client when I walk into the room is I am not morally superior. It seems to be this, this um, assumption of, oh, I'm an ethicist, therefore I'm coming in to tell you how you're a bad person and I'm the better person. That's not at all true. I'm a human, I mess up all the time. I am, however, trained to identify the specific situations as being ones with high impact, high ethical impact and societal impact. Um, so oftentimes with technology, there are these decisions get lost in the day to day. Um, they're very nuanced and it's hard to spot when you're making a very important ethical decision. I'm trained to spot those, those instances. And then I am trained in the methods and frameworks to then work through the decisions that lead you to the best possible decision in that moment. Um, as I like to say, I am trained in translating these high level <clears throat> abstract ethical values into concrete detailed um, decisions in your day-to-day -day situations. So there is a very specific skill set that comes along with an ethics background and ethics training background. Um, it's not the same as being aware of, of policies and aware of issues and aware of talking points. And an ethicist does have a very specific skill set, just as a data scientist, just as a programmer does. Um, our skill set is more based on, uh, our, our skill set really is, is based in critical thinking. Um, but it is, again, it is a specific skill set. Okay, for example, for a person that wants to start into this field, what, what would be your advice to uh, maybe some literature or like some website or where to start, uh, for example, uh, after faculty or uh, before they join the faculty? What, what would be, let's say, pathway to, to become an AI ethicist? Yeah, so one of the first steps I always recommend people is to become well-versed in the space. Um, there's a lot of grassroots efforts going on. Uh, there's plenty of podcasts. I, I always recommend the Radical AI podcast and the Machine Ethics podcast. Those are those two are always fantastic. Um, off of those two podcasts, uh, we have something in ethical intelligence called the Equation. It's a, an, a, a training dashboard essentially um, that has different. A podcast episodes, case studies, workshops through it. Um, we go through different topics each month. These are great introductory pieces to under to first understanding. Um, am I interested in this space? First of all, um, what does this space look like? What are some of these key issues? From there, really the skill set of an ethicist. Um, I recommend if someone wants to seriously become an ethicist in in AI, uh, they do need some type of humanitarian training. Uh, humanitarian background, um, excuse me, humanities, not humanitarian, humanities, um, meaning academia looking at a philosophy degree, really. Um, philosophy, social impact, there's tons and tons of different uh, degrees now popping up in a lot of major European universities. You'll see it under the, ter under the name like um, uh, philosophy, technology, and society, uh, applied ethics. Um, there are especially now degrees specifically in AI ethics, those are the kind of degrees that are, are serious. Those ones are very much pointed at you are you are training to be an ethicist um, in the truest sense beyond just the the high level advisory and consulting. Um, you're actually learning that skill set that's required. 
Awesome. And what, what was your path for starting your own company? Like, uh, was it hard to find the first projects? And uh, because, for example, in our region, it's uh, still everything is still in the development, like the ecosystem. And uh, it, it's uh, hard to find uh, somebody who is experienced in this field. So I'm curious to hear how, how that is in America. It's really interesting. Um, so I can, I will speak in terms of the European market and the American market. Um, so Ethical Intelligence is a Scottish-based enterprise. Started it out of the University of Edinburgh um, and has mainly been EU-based. I'm now based in San Francisco um, as the conversation here is just now picking up. The states have definitely been be behind the EU. The EU has really led uh, the conversation around AI ethics, the efforts around AI ethics, and now we're just starting to see the states and especially the Silicon Valley now talks about it as a serious factor instead of something that's brushed aside. This is becoming a serious factor um, out here in, in the, the middle of the tech bubble that, it, that exists here. Um, it's interesting. It's definitely, um, there's different approaches depending on the culture. One of the issues and, um, one of the issues has been identifying the talent. And, and for the talent's perspective, there are a lot of young, bright people coming out of university degrees without a clear pathway towards a career in this space. Um, an organization that's doing a great job in actually building that pipeline is um, called All Tech is Human. They're based out of New York, but it is developing that pipeline. So instead of just seeing there are internships in, in AI ethics and there are C-suite positions in AI ethics and nothing in between, we're now seeing more and more positions pop up that actually concentrate on the middle positions. Um, so we're seeing that pipeline now built. Um, it is a very cool, it's a, I could look at this as this is, it's a challenge. It's really hard. There's not a clear set career path in this field yet. There's not a clear set way of developing a company in this in this industry. It's it's a brand new industry. No one's done this before. There's no there's no guidelines to follow. Um, I could see that as a challenge, but from my perspective, that is an amazing opportunity because the people that are at work in this field right now, we're shaping what what this industry is going to look like for years and years and years to come, um, including the positions, the careers, the the companies that will really really are not only shaping the responsible tech industry, the AI ethics industry, but are also shaping the next wave of technology. The, I, I totally agree with you. And I really like the point that you mentioned also that uh, EU is leading the, the AI in ethics because compared to China and the uh, US, we are kind of falling behind. And uh, what it's also valuable in Europe, there's a lot of talent that is uh, a big talent pool that is still uh, unused, uh, its full potential. So I think uh, that the, there is a good uh, forecast that if we are leading at least one part, that there will be uh, like uh, movement in, in other, other parts and progress as well. Uh, okay, uh, I want to see if there is any questions from the audience. Um, like the tech crew maybe will show us. Uh, while we are waiting, uh, I want to ask as well, like, is, um, for example, if uh, a company uh, wants to, to have a consultation or implement uh, this uh, in their um, culture, what is the best uh, moment, like, to, to, is it like in the beginning of the project or what is the best moment to ask the consultation or, or think about the AI ethics? So from the very beginning, um, and this is, this is for both large enterprises, this is for startups. If you are bringing in the consultation, the ideation, the, the um, ethics expertise at the start, at the ideation phase, then what that does is help shape and frame the rest of the project throughout its entire life cycle. And you are setting up, um, think of it as you are building your house on a solid foundation then. Um, and it's absolutely essential to have that kind of consultation at the very beginning during ideation because it helps you have a full 360 view of what you're actually creating, um, both in the best and the worst possible ways. Um, it's 
you're going in with your eyes wide open instead of bringing it in later on and, and trying to fix things that you know will be costly in some cases to to go back and fit, fix in retrospect you are being proactive um and then especially when it comes to startups specifically they're kind of there are two key points in in the startup's life uh, life cycle that ai ethics is incredibly not even um not even useful, but essential. Um, and that is during that beginning product ideation. Again, we're back to the ideation phase, but that beginning product ideation where you're forming exactly what your product is. And then again, it comes back into play when you go to scale, because as soon as you go to scale, you are, start, you are making different decisions and those decisions have a different level of impact. They have, they have a wider reach. So that very beginning product ideation stage and then when you're going, going, not even going to market, but you're going to scale, those are those are the two sweet spots where you bring in any type of AI ethics, you in, not even bring in, you invest in ethics um, advice and ethics consulting, and it is night and day difference of benefit for your startup. Amazing, thanks a lot. I think this was a valuable response uh, and the like, uh, also to addition to everything else uh there is a uh, questions from audience so have you i think you already kind of half uh answered to this one have you tried to cooperate with uh, eu companies in terms of ethical ai yes so the majority of our clients are uk and eu based um we actually prior to the pandemic worked mainly with large enterprise and then during the pandemic um well once the pandemic hit we noticed that we had a lot of founders and programmers reaching out to us that were working on COVID technology. And they were coming to us saying, we're in rapid design cycles and we know that these are important issues and we have no resources for this. So that, that actually led to us shifting, um, not geographically, but shifting size of company that we were working with. Uh, but the majority of our clients are EU and UK based. Awesome, thank you. So, uh, second question is: Have you watched Netflix's uh, Social Dilemma? <laughs> what is your stand on ethical design? Oh, that makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> so, with the Social Dilemma, I also recommend watching Coded um, uh, the Coded Bias um, uh, documentary that's also come out. So, the Social Dilemma is a very interesting one. Um, it was frustrating to watch from the perspective. So we're part of the grassroots responsible tech community. Um, it was frustrating for us to watch this because we stand behind ethical design, absolutely ethics by design, all of those, all of those key terms. It was very frustrating to watch the social dilemma because it was this this hour and a half long documentary about here are all these problems that we created and there's no one working on this. And the our entire community sitting here trying to scream out, like, we're here, we're, we are working on this. That's a complete and utter lie. We are making massive steps, massive progress in the direction of actually understanding the best points in time, how, the best practices of ethical design. And it, it, was, it was very frustrating to see that of um, a lot of my friends even outside of, of, of my field where we're, worried and concerned from this documentary they're like there's nothing going it's doomsday it's all these terrible things are happening i'm like yes there's all these terrible things happening but you have some of the world's most brilliant minds working on solutions it's it's a lie there, there's there's so many people working in this field and there's really brilliant amazing people working in this field and there needs to be that credit given in that direction Thank you, Lily. I think that's uh, also uh, when it comes to other communities as well, there is a pattern on having a blind spot on what community is doing. So maybe a good advice would be as well for enterprises and maybe some uh, more uh, government-led companies. And uh, let's say the whole ecosystem should be more collaborating with the, the communities and, uh, and maybe have more stories in the articles on what they are doing because there is always a positive side of the story as well mm. awesome so um question number three uh, is being ethical scientist more of a lone wolf uh, position or you may see that uh, teams of different roles will be essential in the ethical ai implementation teams um team buy-in is so important and it 
it, right now, it is a bit of a lone, lone wolf situation where you'll have one person championing it within a team. Um, the best companies and the best team, the, really the best companies are ones where it's the full team buy-in and everyone is uh, has a part to play in the considerations around, around ethics. Either they're bringing in ideas or they're being trained in the skill set. Um, you do need a leader. You do still need that champion no matter what that drives the considerations that drive that the one that's that's sitting there asking, okay, guys, are we sure? Have we considered this? Um, you need that person who uh, they're usually called an ethics owner, but that person whose mind is always on these issues, but they need the buy-in from the team. The team needs to be able to uh, have different responsibilities in upholding in and bringing ethics to life in the product. That's really the only way that you see the the maximum amount of um, return on your investment into ethics. Awesome, thank you. Next question. Uh, do you think that uh, we need some kind of cooperation on an internal level, such as uh, UN or a WWW initiative or a regulatory body on the international level, uh, which would be the governing body of AA development at the end? Yeah, I think having, um, having an organization that hosts and promotes and researches best practices uh, would be immensely helpful. One thing that I um, not warn, it, it kind of warn against in this is we don't want to over-regulate this, this space. There is a difference between um, requiring ethical consideration at, versus requiring specific steps um, right now, the field is too young to set down those steps and say, uh, you must, um, for example, let, let's take the example of transparency. You must have a transparent algorithm that meets X, Y, and Z metrics. It's too young of a field. We can't, we, we don't have X, Y, and Z metrics yet. Um, but we do have the ability to say it is a requirement to have a certain level of transparency within your, your algorithm. Um, it's, it's a different type of, of approach. We still want to have the flexibility to learn and grow in this field, um, just as there is cutting edge research in terms of AI technology, there's cutting edge research in the ethical under, understanding of that AI technology and having an international corporation that uh, houses all of that research and development and best practices would be immensely helpful. Awesome, okay, the question number five. Uh, do you think is it okay to use AI for marketing purposes? Uh, why yes and why not? <laughs> That's a really good one. Um, that is a really good one because we, we saw the explosion of ad tech <clears throat> and the marketing, oh, Yes, AI is okay to use for marketing purposes um, in very set ways. Um, some users are okay with having their personal data determine the ads that they want to see, but not everyone is. The key difference here is the user doesn't have the ability to decide. So for example, I, I hate, um, personalized advertising. It, I just don't like it. I don't like it. It freaks me out. And oftentimes I question like, why, why is this showing up? What, what have I Googled recently that this is what, what seems to fit me? I don't like it. I don't mind seeing ads that aren't relevant to me. So in that case, I want the ability, I want to have the agency to say, do not use my data for marketing purposes. However, I do have friends who are like, I love personalized ads. I think it's so useful. I get, I, that's how I check out. That's how I find um, my next jacket that I want to wear. That's how I find the product that I was looking for. So there are people that want those personalized marketing ads and there are people that don't. The problem is the user has, has zero ability to decide that for themselves. So the ones that don't want it are having this technology forced on them. And the ones that do want it are really actually having um, their personal ads being affected by the users that are not wanting them. And, and uh, there are certain steps that you can do to kind of uh, mess with your algorithm, so to speak. Um, that also trickles into people who like the personalized ads. So using AI for marketing purposes is, isn't unethical in and of itself. Um, 
the application of it and the current use of it, there are serious questions towards the ethics of it. Okay, I, I totally agree that uh, I on that side that uh, that personalized ads personalized ads creeps me out sometimes. As you said, it is like why does this show up? Like, should I know something that, that I don't exactly. know? So it's it's really kind of awkward sometimes. But uh, as you said, there is uh, people who who really enjoyed it. Uh, okay, I uh, want for the end to ask like, what is your message to the professionals that want to to join uh, ethical? Uh, AI field or to become the AI ethicist? Yeah. Um, my message is it takes a lot of backbone. You're going to find a lot of brave and courageous people working in this field. Um, and this isn't to deter you, this is to encourage you because the people working in this field are determined to make a dent in. Um, what has become a massive industry of technology that was developed with end goals that are out of date. And it's time that we start updating those. Um, my call to people is it's going to be hard at the very beginning. It is hard. Um, but if you are brave and if you're courageous coming into this field, there is such good, there's such strong imp potential impact that you can have not only for yourself, but for generations to come. And that's the important part. Um, and to not give up that this is this is this field is just breaking out of its infancy. And really what I tell people is the new wave of technology is an ethical, is ethical technology. It's not um, blockchain or deep tech or fancy technology, it's ethical technology. And it's no longer a question of um, will ethics be a part of the conversation? It's are you versed in ethics and able to speak on an essential core element of technology? Um, so it's uh, get on get on the bandwagon, so to speak. It's 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 a cause worth fighting for. Okay, thank you a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy that you joined the conference, and I'm sure that the audience has a valuable. Uh, heard the valuable uh, perspectives on uh, why is it important and how to, to join this field. Uh, also, maybe to add for the end, I think that um, going into this field, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs will need help and guidelines uh, around it. So it is a really, really perspective field in terms of uh, there will be a lot of a lot of jobs created in this field in the future. So that, that's a really good outcome. Okay, uh, I want to thank you once again and uh, really, really happy that, that you shared your viewpoints and uh, thank you for your time. And uh, uh, thank, thanks to the audience for great questions once again. And uh, that's it, enjoy your rest of the day. And that's it, Alex. <laughs> thank you, you. thanks, Anita. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.